Talagang anak, ti. Panimbasong, ti. Mabuhi pa ka, ti. Di pa ta mga matay, ti. Si hilak, mami. Hilak kami kay. Mamatay na dito. Mabuhi sa gatin. Pahingon lang dito dito ang hindi. Pero at to, dito sila gipahingon. Kaya dito, tas sila sa unahan nga. Kapalay, ako nga balay. Sulog mang kaayo. Nakabanon man sila. Dilikado bitaw. So, balik, balik. The Philippines experiences an average of 20 typhoons each year, yet typhoons never fail to leave a bad mark. 2011 saw the Philippines topping the list of countries hit the hardest by disasters. On the eve of December 16, 2011, the city of Cagayan de Oro witnessed the wrath of Typhoon Sendong, international name Washi, living in its wake billions worth of damages and over a thousand displaced families. Cagayan de Oro is rarely hit by disasters. Sendong is the strongest tropical storm that hit Cagayan in a span of nine decades. Because of disasters being so unusual in this region, its population was not prepared for it. This event highlighted scientific consensus that regions that did not experience extreme weather events in the past could become more vulnerable. Cagayan de Oro was a case in point. It's very difficult to link one event to climate change. Um, we can just say that uh, so far, um, in terms of uh, the amount of rainfall brought about by this typhoon, then the amount um, for a nine-hour period uh, was exceeded. However, um, if it's uh, really already the sign or the, we can say that this is, this shows that this is already climate change, maybe this is signs, one of the signs. Passengers, my name is Mark, once again from Philippine Airlines. Thank you and welcome to Korea. Six months have passed here in Cagayan de Oro and everything seems to be back to normal. However, it cannot be dismissed that Sendong has changed the lives of those who have been displaced. Problems of livelihood, lands, relocations and housing resonate from the grim tragedy. Here in Cagayan de Oro, it's almost a miracle that we were able to settle all the victims within a period of 90 days. We were able to settle permanently. Uh, we were able to establish houses for them within a period of 90 days because normally it takes them two to three years to permanently settle all the victims of the calamities in other countries, including also some areas here in the Philippines. From their uh, original location to the evacuation center to the transitional site and finally to their permanent houses. And all this in 90 days? We were able to start. Savior Heights is amongst the 30 temporary camps administered by the government to cater for families who lost their homes when Sendong struck. Six months after their arrival in Savior Heights, some fortunate families are heading to their permanent homes, one of which is the Yanez family. Ako si Artemio Yanez, nagpuyo ang nagatira sa doon. Nagatira sa Isla Pundod, Balulang, o Luer. Uh, karon ani ako sa Severe Heights, Coverport. I'm 
Ano'y kayong makaya baka na makaroon ng isa o na? Dahil yung kapaminaw natin, brother, isa na yung makaroon ng nagsugod at kanya. Okay lang. Maski lagay pa rin siya ko na pero okay lang. At least nakaplastan na. Masaya man ikaw? Oo. Mas kampante mag-udili ka sa tent lang. Just a few kilometers away from the Kalaanan Resettlement Site, Families wait in tent cities to be given new homes. After six months, their harsh conditions are apparent, with most of them still depending on aid. So, uh, I don't want to look back with us. We're, very, we're, not, we're not yet recovered for that uh, situation actually. And then from that time, and then we're going to end, uh, then we transfer in this place. Uh, all pains, uh, there is always pains, heart aches, and then scared at night, every time we sleep. We have no, I mean, we had a lot of questions, why were we lived here, why many people were relocated. The priority, of, uh, the priority for transparent people is uh, who, most people who are person with disability and those mini childs. Like that I sana not that na no na sila not transfer because they're one they're senior citizens and me I have two child five and two years old but why we live here this area and then last night we were very scared Liverings yeah and the water was flooded in our tent beds and in tents then when we step on our, up on our tents, the water was, I mean, <laughs> Mayor says, I mean, the local government says that uh, we're last three to four months, but sabi nila, three to four months lang daw yung dapat namin dito. Kasi yung tents, ang life duration ng tents is six months. And then, seven months na po kami hello, seven months na po, and then, nasisira na talaga yung tent namin. Very... <laughs> Not only have they lost everything in the disaster, but it's hard for the families here to start anew when their livelihoods are inaccessible. Relocation sites like this one are far from the city center. Continue, kung kung namang gusto trabaho pag kaug ma, trabaho kaya kung saan kaya nagtrabaho kaya sa Tita Fanish, sa una Tita Fanish, Limpon Chicken House. You work in the studio? Ah, before, before. Ah, before. Now do what do you do? No work, no job, no jobs. Kumiot mal, malang kumiot di. Saan po yung mga ng food? Saan? Ito sa DSWD may nagbibigay. DSWD is the one giving them food. Kaso ngayon matagal tagal na tag one month. No on. Every 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 week, meron ngayon almost a month, you know. And the sad thing to say until now, um, they most of them they've been telling that uh, up to now they don't have yet resettlement or relocation area. Actually, most of those people who were evacuated, or most of the families who were evacuated in these evacuation centers are still waiting where the government will transfer them or where the government will relocate them. The local government had already imposed an ordinance that people can stay in the so-called no-build zones. However, to spare themselves from the harsh conditions in the tent cities, some victims went back to their homes despite the risks. Such is the case of Barangay Consolacion, situated along the Cagayan de Oro River. Yeah, oh, 
situation. A major reason that has influenced victims to go back the no-build zones is that the rehabilitation camps are hardly accessible. Most of the victims have their livelihoods in the city center. Kuan lang ganang gin, check lang naman kung napamapurin ang balay tapos ang akong bar na nag-habal-habal magod siya na ato siya din tumadak ang siya sa gasolina. Muna nga din siya siya nag-stay kayo kung free upak. Pero in a time, ugo po niya siya, ugo ka maginam. The government even shut down the power in the area, but the people chose to remain. Uh, I have only the light. Ah, uh, because that after ang kanabita nga balay di ha, naman siya balay to stabok nga wala na apil sa demolish nag yan gitap. In Barangay Makasindi, a declared hazard zone. The people were left with no choice but to stay in their old homes. Although they live in a flood-prone area, they are least prioritized for the relocation sites, keeping them in a vulnerable position. Di na daw po hindi kay ako na ang nayota bitaw, nayota na kay title, dili na po hindi ipakit daw. And since may title sila, so medyo hindi sila priority dun sa mga evacuation sites and relocation sites. People in the communities who strive to address the issues brought about by Sandong, such as climate change, environmental plunder, and we, we strive or we believe that these communities will be able to stand up for themselves again. That's what we are doing. We help them rebuild not only their homes but also their lives. Uh, what, that's what one of the Barsa Mindanao activities are. We help organize the survivors so that uh, they would be collective in their uh, in addressing their needs to the government. Like we need what we need. Aside from housing, we also need livelihood, we also need jobs. So with the organization, with Bansa Mindanao, the survivors are able to organize themselves, to work collectively, and to act together. Without government's help and being aware of their vulnerability, the community created a collective of survivors. Its purpose is to protect the community from another typhoon. But whenever there are heavy rains, they go to the river to check the water level and to warn the community in case of an eventual flood. Also, the collective knows where the elderly, the pregnant women and the kids live so that they will be prioritized. We have been improving our early warning system for typhoon and floods. So uh, this is one of a, a, a kind of adaptation strategy so that we can minimize the impacts of climate change, particularly on um, climate and weather. Faced with a gloomy future, Xavier Echoville tries to address problems of the victims of Sendong by putting up a resettlement community organized by Xavier University Ateneo de Cagayan. It stands out in its promotion of community values and environment-friendly ways. It also organizes livelihood programs and has its own rules and regulations to maintain peace and order. Xavier Echoville also aims to create and strengthen community values by holding different activities every weekend. There are talent shows, sports and games to relieve children from the trauma. Moreover, since families in Xavier Echoville came from different barangays, its camp managers launched the Values Formation Program where people have the opportunity to get to know each other. All people here are not the same. Barangay, we are all separated, uh, just like a Balulang, Barangay Balulang, Barangay Kaswagan, Barangay uh, Makasandig. So, the values for mission, uh, just to prepare the how to love your neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, just to give up, uh, give a sharing. Uh, uh, sharing. Because of Typhoon Sindong, mm -hmm. so we cannot meet its other. So, we are now a new community, so the civil ecoville needs uh, every one of the beneficiaries in the ecoville to, sh to give sharing, loving, and most of all, uh, peace and order. It's almost a 
the most important is God. That's mm -hmm. a, uh, we get the values. Yeah. I like the rules and regulation of <clears throat> a civil eco bill because uh, a lot like other education uh, center, uh, like a Karaanan, every now and then they have trouble because there's no regulation, there's no rules that we follow. One of the main goals of Xavier Echoville is to train the victims to be self-sufficient. Each house is a plot of land available for cultivation. Families can have access to livelihood programs. As an example, they can choose to build their own permanent houses. The community also has a cooperative to encourage economic activities and sustain self-sufficiency. Despite all positive features of Xavier Echoville, it still shows inherent problems of rehabilitation camps, distance from the city and the jobs, and dependency from aid. The transportation, to compare the transportation, it's so hard because uh, uh, it's so far, far from the city. But uh, for now, I have no work, so I cannot. Uh, it's feel better because I will not. Uh, I will not go here in the city. Yes, because uh, sometimes, seguro after this uh, turnover, my then what shall I do here? So I live there in Ecoville, and vol I, I plan to I plan to make my voluntary help to the staff to build up all the good community because I don't uh, I have no plan yet where to go, where to start, and to get. A financial support to the children. I don't know. Oh, I don't know yet. I don't. Know. I just pray for the blessings, for the miracles, perhaps. The different experiences of Sendong victims show that there are inherent problems in the rehabilitation process. Six months after, they still haven't gotten their lives back. In the permanent camps, they do not have jobs. In the hazard zones, they are still vulnerable while others are still waiting for a home in the tent cities. According to the National Housing Authority, only about 38% of the proposed houses by the government were constructed. The recent years in the Philippines have seen disasters causing billions worth of damages and displacing over a million people. So if climate is changing, thus enhancing the strength and frequency of natural hazards. How can we reduce vulnerability? The essence of our law is um, shifting from doing emergency or reactions to disaster. It's more on disaster preparedness, preventions and mitigations. So that's why it's, it's, it's still too far. Uh, how the local government will really implement the new law that uh, took place in 2010. I think one very critical thing that you've learned is really land use plan and la land use in particular. Not just the plan but really the implementation. People were really staying on harm's way on hazard and flood prone areas and I think that is what contributed, contributed to so much death no? um, in, the, in the said flooding. Uh, yeah, I think one. And of course, um, if there have been better early warning uh, systems uh, between the ridges of Putignon up to Cagayan, uh, then warning would have also been better. It is true that when we disturb the land, um, uh, the dynamics of water is uh, disturbed. And so if we do some mining, some logging, and even agriculture, and even doing subdivision um, projects, may really alter the, the water site, the water process, or the, the, where water flows, and even the amount of water that will flow through the river. We are not only addressing issues related to disasters but also we are also helping uh, this, the people how they would also uh, help themselves they would um, of 
course, educated, uh, being informed of the different hazards that mostly uh, affecting them, helping them how to determine where are the safe way in their areas. Climate change will multiply and strengthen natural hazards in the future. The case of Sendong highlighted a broader reality that transcends national boundaries. This reality calls for people to adapt to the changing climate. Without adaptation, tent cities could become the norm.